Hi, this is Bradley, and you're listening to Psych Everywhere. In this episode, Psychi President Dr. Regan A. R. Goering interviews Dr. Carolyn Brown Kramer about strategies to create successful group work experiences. Dr. Brown Kramer is an assistant professor of practice at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. A social psychologist by training, she teaches courses in introductory psychology, social psychology, advanced social psychology, and motivation and emotion. There are so many questions that psychology can answer about group work. In particular, this episode focuses on strategies for group organizers. For example, how can professors ensure that students have the necessary information and the best opportunity to succeed in a group. Should they assign group members? Or should they let them choose their own groups? And what about periodic progress checks? Are these helpful? Having listened ahead to this interview, I know that you're in for a real treat. So, with no further ado, I'll let Dr. Goering take it from here. All right, uh, this is Regan Garong, and I have the pleasure today of talking to Carolyn Brown Kramer, who is at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And I had the pleasure of, of listening to Carolyn talk about group work at the Society for Teaching of Learning and Learning Annual Conference on Teaching. And I just thought, wow, this is, Carolyn has hit and answered just so many of the questions that I know many of us have when we think about group work. And she's consented to come and do a reprise of that for all of you who couldn't make it to ACT or who care about that. Uh, Carolyn, thanks for taking the time to be on here. Absolutely. Thank you for asking me. I'm, I'm delighted. This presidential year, my theme has been psych everywhere. Uh, psychology is everywhere. And I think even using the psychological science and research in how we teach is just one of the many places to, to do it. So let's jump in. So Carol, tell me, what, what made you think about uh, presenting on group work? Well, as many instructors have experienced, I get that first day of class syllabus overview day. As soon as I say, we're gonna be working in groups this semester, I get that complete deer in the headlights look that so many of us are familiar with. Many students hate group work and they're smart folks. They have reasons for not liking it, right? We also as instructors have had experiences where somebody commandeers a project or a group member falls off the face of the planet and then shows up weeks or months later saying, hey, I'm ready for my points. We feel anxious interpersonally about having to work with other people and so students are feeling the same way. Um, I've learned the longer I teach, the more and more I end up using group work and the more I like it. Um, and I found that now through repeating, you know, through doing group work a number of times, most of my students are now saying, hey, that wasn't so bad. Or even, hey, I like this and I would like to do more group work. So it's been an evolution from this students hating group work to students now really appreciating and understanding the value of group work. So let's not, you know, that's, that's great because I think resistance is, is often something that, that pushes many of us to not use a pedagogical technique that we have heard is good or have read about being good and you're absolutely right you know I think many of us face students going groaning with the oh no group work mm -hmm. right so could you could I get you to perhaps when you think about what are the biggest reasons that made you think it's worth the effort so why should we think about putting group work into our classes yeah absolutely so I sort of feel like group work does it all in terms of what we think of as highly effective learning and preparing students for the real world after college. Group work is it, right? So group work helps students engage actively with the material. They're not just sitting there taking notes, they're doing, they're practicing, generating, critiquing. They're working at the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. We all know as instructors that when you have to explain something to somebody else, you suddenly realize, oh, I didn't understand this as well as I thought I did. And so increasing students' metacognition, understanding their abilities, um, increasing their abilities in working with other people, they're going to develop transferable skills for the workplace, critical li uh, listening, presenting evidence and argumentation to help the group understand what they need to understand, um, figuring out how to deal with interpersonal conflicts, developing task-oriented procedures in a reasonable and logical way. These are things that are going to continue to serve them. 
And the other thing that I really like about group work that, that shouldn't be ignored is that students really develop strong, positive interpersonal connections with their peers, that whether they join them on LinkedIn and become colleagues later on, or just uh, for underrepresented minorities, first generation college students, international students, to start to develop a sense of ownership and belonging on campus. So I've seen all of those benefits in my own experience in uh, having students do group work. All right, that, that's, a, that's a good list right there. Mm -hmm. So let's get a little bit more into the pragmatics. When I think about group work, you know, when we opened, you mentioned uh, syllabi and looking at your syllabi, uh, there are different types of group work. Can you give us a sense of, do you use group work in every, every class period throughout the semester? I mean, have you found uh, a sweet spot for how much group work is good group work? And I know this will probably vary by large and small classes and we can go there if need be. But when you think, when you say group work, what are we talking about? Is it every class period? How many times? Give us a sense. I think it it depends, right? So that's a cop-out answer a little bit, but it depends. I don't do it every day. I find that for many students, they just get fatigue working in groups, especially introverts. They need a little bit of time not working with others. So I usually don't do it every day, but in an upper level class, I'll do it every second day or every third day. In an introductory level course, I might do short uh, five to 15 minute group work activities, every second class period. So, I mean, part of it is also dependent on the size of the class. If it's a really big class, I find it much more user-friendly to have the turn to somebody nearby, get in groups of four, and do this really well-defined task for 10 minutes. For upper-level classes, I really like to use consistent groups that students are working in week after week after week so that they start to develop relationships with the people with whom they're working. That's also really, really valuable in upper level classes where students are diving deeply into the material because they can say, man, you know, something that you said four weeks ago really is relevant to what we're talking about today. And if you're shuffling groups up every week, you can't necessarily do that. I also find that having consistent groups, especially in those upper level classes, helps students become more comfortable with each other so that they're willing to disagree. They're willing to take risks with each other that they probably wouldn't be willing to do if it were a completely new group of strangers every time they meet. To pull some of that together then, really when I think about, if I were thinking about group work, I've got to think about both the pragmatic side of it, uh, how large is the class, the composition of the class, and obviously right at the top of the list, uh, I heard it there implicitly, but I wanted to pull it out explicitly, uh, is your student learning outcomes, right? I mean, is a learning outcome for your class going to be solved or addressed by using group work? Uh, and I think that's a big deal because I like I love the way you mentioned Bloom's taxonomy because there are some kinds of I mean multiple choice uh, is not going to help you get at the types of learning and engagement with the material that group work is mm -hmm. and so especially in upper level classes I think with the student learning outcomes being group work will help you address some of those in a much better way so that's pretty neat so you know it also sounds in your response that you have sometimes you have formal. Uh, groups that work for uh, over a period of time, and sometimes you have the informal, especially in larger classes. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of structure do you give students? Do you give them a script? I mean, how do you, you know, it's one thing for you and me to say, oh yeah, group work is great, but I've noticed that for very, many novice students, they don't know how to behave in a group or act in a group. What do you, what do, you do to help that out? One of the ways that I approach teaching is through being as clear and explicit ahead of time as I possibly can be. So I try to be very transparent in my work with students. And that includes when I talk about group work with them. I talk about why we're doing this. I tie it into the student learning outcomes. I tie it into their life outcomes. Um, and then I ask them, we do a lot of feed forward in my classes. So instead of at the very end of the semester where you say, here's the feedback on how you did, I give them feed forward and say, here are the likely stumbling blocks. Let's figure out ahead of time how we're gonna deal with those or how we're gonna prevent them in the first place. And so that can include things like having the group sit down early in the semester, especially if you're doing ongoing groups, um, long, longitudinal groups, and say, group, decide what are your norms? Um, how many times can a student miss group work before they start getting kicked out or having conversations with their group members about getting kicked out? Um, what are the timelines for completion of work? What happens if somebody 
doesn't do their part of the group project, right? How is the group going to deal with that? And rather than me saying, here are the rules that I am going to impose from above, I really encourage students to do that from a grassroots perspective so that it's the group members themselves discussing and deciding, and then everybody in the group has to agree to it. That way, if a student violates the policies that they and their peers have set, they're facing the peers instead of me and my rules that I've imposed from above. It also makes it very, very clear that they're not guessing about what the expectations are. They know because they've signed off on it in the very beginning of the semester. So, you know, related to that, that makes me think about group composition, right? Uh, and I think one of the earliest questions that I know I ask myself is, well, should I assign groups or should I let them pick their own groups? What do you think? What does the literature say? I am an advocate of assigning students to groups. Um, and there's a lot of literature on that. So for instance, the team-based learning literature says assign groups rather than self-selecting. Um, it's okay to do random groups, especially if you have a large class and you don't know the students, you don't have any means for putting them in systematic groups. Um, if you can, intentional groups are, are believed to be better. So the reason that I like assigning students rather than letting them self-select, um, number one, you see right off the bat, as they get in the groups, they're not doing as much off-topic chatter. Um, so they're more likely to focus on the task that's at hand rather than who did what the last weekend. It also splits up cliques. So you don't have students who are all from the same sorority or who are all in the same athletic organization um, sitting together. And you can also increase diversity, right? So part of what I said before was increasing different student groups ownership of and belonging on campus. So if you can mix groups up in terms of domestic and international students, students with different majors, students of different genders, all sorts of different characteristics, all of a sudden, instead of students only interacting with their in-group, they're being exposed to a much more diverse crowd of peers. Um, the other thing, I got this tip from another colleague a couple of years ago, and I love it. When I create groups systematically, um, especially groups that are going to be working together for a long period of time, several weeks or over the course of a semester, I create groups that are homogeneous in procrastination tendency but heterogeneous in terms of uh, introversion and extroversion. So what I mean by that is I give them a survey at the very beginning of the semester and I say, you know, tell me a little bit about your personality. And then as I'm creating groups, I put the procrastinators all together. Mm -hmm. And I put the early submitters all together because I found that students get so frustrated working with the opposite type of peer. Right, so the, the non-procrastinators are hounding their procrastinator friends saying, where is your part of the project? The procrastinators are saying, why do you need this done five days early? So there's just a lot of stress that doesn't need to be there. If you put the procrastinators together, they're all happy to turn it in the night before. So wow. that has helped a lot. That's, that's another level of planning, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm guessing once you do it and work it out, it, 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 bear, it pays off in the, in the long term. But that's, just, that's a really interesting idea to make sure that, that those groups are set up in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty neat. Once you assign them then, and, and you mentioned, uh, I, loved, I loved the notion of feed forward. And I think that's mm -hmm. a phrase that not, you don't hear too often. But I, I love the way, I'm glad you brought it up and talked about that, you know, the warning and what, having students watch out for things. Uh, and, and here in the case of before you throw students off the island, as it were, what, you know, what do you do? Let's move on to the assessment of group work. Do you do formative, uh, related to groups looking at themselves, do you do formative assessments of the group and summative? What are your, what are your recommendations for assessing group work? I think that depends a lot on how the groups are structured and the tasks that they're doing. But alongside whatever the learning outcome is for the actual task, right, what is the score that this group gets on the final presentation or the paper or the homework or whatever it is that they're doing, I always have some component of the grade and the learning experience based on how they did their group work. So if it's a one-off group, I mostly solve that by just walking around the classroom and observing how the groups are interacting and then when necessary, intervening when I see somebody who's off task or somebody who's dominating the group. In longer term groups, I think it's really, really valuable to give the students a voice and to give them the ability to respond back about what's going on behind the scenes. So, of course, a group that's going to be working on an assignment or an activity outside of class, there's stuff that I can't see that's going on among them. 
And so I always want to ask the students, how did your peers do? How did you do? Um, and again, you can just do this at the end of the activity, at the end of the semester. That's, you know, summative. How did you do? But I also find it really, really helpful to do formative feedback. So in a group that's going to be working together for, say, 12 weeks, I'll often ask them either midway through or a third of the way through, how's everybody doing in your group? How are you doing? And I like to do this in a very structured way, so of course you get much more useful feedback. And then I'll take that feedback that their peers gave and give them anonymously to the, each of the group members. So they can say, oh, my group members noticed that I wasn't there for three of our meetings. And my group members have recognized my contributions above and beyond the expectations. So that shows students where they are relative to the expectations. And then the idea is that they can make changes as needed before their grade is on the line. So I very rarely give points at the very end without saying, here's how you're doing along the way. So I always want to give them an opportunity to change and improve. Um, and by giving them that formative feedback, they have the opportunity to do that. So that, that makes me wonder then, uh, do you then give everybody in the group the same grade or does, do people in the group get individual grades or does it vary based on the class? Varies based on the class. And there are different schools of thought about which one is best. I was just talking with a colleague in classics the other day where he gives all members of the group the same grade. Um, I tend not to do that because number one, students get very upset about it. Um, but I also think that you might give students the same grade for the product, but not necessarily for the process. Because we know that the same sort of thing happens in the workplace, right? You might all be judged as a group based on the quality of what your group creates, but your boss is probably gonna recognize who did most of the contributions. So I'm trying to set them up for that expectation and develop that professionalism now when it's a little bit lower stakes. Okay. And you know, into how, how, how have you evolved with group work? I mean, I, do you now feel like you've got it down or are you still changing and tweaking, <laughs> you know, things that you're doing? I'm always changing, always changing things, always looking for new ideas and new tips. Um, I certainly do things differently now than I used to. And so I feel like I'm getting better. I'm getting closer to some end goal if there is indeed such a thing as perfect group work. Um, one of the things that I do now that I didn't used to do when I was a young and naive faculty member, um, I now always require students to complete some sort of task ahead of time and hold them accountable for doing it. The first few times I did group work, I just assumed that the social pressure of the group would be enough to ensure that students do the thing they're supposed to and come prepared. And I learned the hard way that expectation was often not met. So what I do now is I might have students complete a reading and write a page of response, write a one-page response paper. Or I might have them uh, watch a TED Talk and complete a short quiz about the content so that when they come to do their group work, they're not saying, what was that video all about? I didn't read it. Um, so it's that accountability that helps the students all know I can trust my peers because I know that they've all completed this and it gives them a shared basis for the conversation that they're going to have as a group. Any other lessons learned as we wind up? What are some of the things that, you know, you'd like to share with listeners as they think about fine tuning or even using more group work? I've changed a lot the kinds of tasks and the amount of time I give my students to work in groups. Um, so I try to be very focused and tell them ahead of time what the time limit is for this given task. Even if it's one of these, turn to somebody nearby, I always say, here's how much time you're gonna have to discuss. Because I find that the conversations that students have when I say, take five minutes to discuss, are very different from the take one minute to discuss. Um, and so, I want to make sure that they get through what they need to do, but also go into the appropriate level of depth. I've also provided much more structured tasks than I used to. Five years ago, I might have said something like, take five minutes to discuss Piaget's theory of psychosocial development. And some students will still be talking after 10 minutes, and some students will take one minute and then they'll be sitting there. So it's a very unstructured prompt. 
So these days I would use something much more detailed and structured with a product that they have to produce by the end of their conversation. So I might say, you have the same five minutes, you are still discussing in groups, but I want you to identify three criticisms of Piaget's theory of psychosocial development, formulate an argument on whether it should still be taught in introductory psychology, and be prepared to present your argument to the class. That's going to give much more detailed conversation. It's going to produce something, and the students are held accountable for actually having the conversation and staying on target for the entire five minutes. All right. That's, that's a lot of good stuff. Uh, anything else you want to add on group work? The last thing that I want to add is, of course, students are going to self-select into particular roles. So you have the extrovert is going to always want to be the reporter and the introvert is going to be the, the science officer. And somebody who has good handwriting, which is almost always the women in the group, is going to be designated as the recorder. What that does is it shortchanges students who don't have those characteristics because they are missing out on these other learning opportunities and these other roles. So I have moved much more strongly toward either randomizing roles and say, all right, the person with the shortest pinky is the group mm -hmm. captain today, or the person who was born earliest in the year is the recorder, or else I'll rotate. So it's really easy, even in a large class, to say, pass the paper around. I don't want to see the same handwriting on all of the questions. So through just little tweaks like that, sometimes you can make a big difference in helping all of the students feel like they're accountable, they're uh, engaged, and that their group is really depending on them. So let's end with this scenario, right? Here's this faculty member who's been teaching for some time, but they see group work as just too much work and have never used it. What would you say to that faculty member? I would encourage them to think about the benefits and say, well, what's something that's not working in your group, in your class? If there's something that's not working in your class, see if you can reinvent it. Just that one thing from a group work perspective. And you don't have to completely restructure your course around group work. Most of my classes, especially my lower cl level classes, are not structured around group work. It's one small aspect of a really complex puzzle. So I'm a big fan of the incremental approach to improving teaching. So if you say, I'm going to try one group activity a month, right? That's a really small ask, but you can try it out, see how it works. If it doesn't go as well as you'd like, do something a little bit different the next month. So that's much less high stakes than I'm going to completely reinvent my class to be based entirely around a semester long group project. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Carolyn, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Before we sign off, I'd also like to say I know you are a psychi advisor at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Thank you very much for your service because we know how important advisors are. So special uh, thank you for that. And again, thank you so much for your work in the group. I look forward to getting this out there. This is Regan Brum signing off for Psychi. Take care. Bye-bye. You've just listened to another episode of Psych Everywhere. I really appreciate Dr. Brown Kramer for providing all of those totally fascinating answers about embracing group work in the classroom and beyond. Also, I want to thank Dr. Goering for taking the lead on this interview. If you can't get enough of this episode, then I've got some really great news. Dr. Brown Kramer wrote a companion article to this interview all about group work. You can read that article, Tips for Making Group Work Work, in the latest issue of Ion Psychi Magazine. To read that article, visit www.psichi.org backslash EYE. It's been an exciting year so far for Psych Everywhere. Looking back, we've recently spoken with Dr. Steven Pinker about how bad news isn't the whole story. Dr. Ira Hyman shared about unicycling clowns and inattentional blindness. And Dr. Janina Scarlett shared about superhero therapy. So what has been your favorite episode so far? Please help us shape the future of this podcast by leaving a brief review on Apple Podcasts. We'd really appreciate your feedback 
and this will help to get the show to additional listeners too. Okay, that's all for now. I'll talk to you again soon. Copyright 2020. Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.